Just want to make sure everyone can hear me before I get started. Getting some hellos loud and clear. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to Crafty Adults at the Champaign Public Library. My name is Laura Rice and I work here at the library and I help coordinate this series of events. And this series is Crafty Adults. Um, it's a super popular series that we host here at the library. Each session focuses on a different creative project that can usually be completed within about an hour. Uh, we started this series as an in-person event, obviously, a few years ago, and we transitioned into hosting virtually last year, along with everybody else, and it's actually been going really well. It's been successful for us, and we've done lots of different crafts, including collage, weaving, macrame, we even did flower arranging, just to name a few. So we like to get crafty here at the library, and I'm super happy to have you all joining us this evening. I think we're getting a little bit of a different crew than we normally get, which I'm excited to welcome you all here. Um, tonight is a special event, and we are welcoming several folks here from the Rare Book and Manuscript Library and the Ricker Library of Architecture and Art to teach us about medieval manuscripts. So in this class, we're going to go over what a medieval manuscript is and how they're created. We'll also be talking about making parchment, ink, and quills, and we're going to have a calligraphy lesson. So I'm really excited for this class. I think it's going to be informative and fun. I think you all are really going to enjoy it. So this evening, our presenters will be Ruth Ann Mowry, who is the visiting curator at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. We'll also have Carrie Lingscheit, who is the office support specialist at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. And we'll have Siobhan McKissick, who is the visiting design and materials librarian at the Ricker, Ricker Architecture and Art Library. I almost got through that whole thing without messing it up. Um, both of those libraries are here at the University of Illinois campus in Champaign-Urbana. Um, we also have Rachel Ferrier here from the Champaign Public Library to help facilitate the webinar. So we've got a lot of people here this evening. And before I pass it on to them, to our presenters, I do want to go over some logistics about how we will, we will be running the webinar. So we're going to primarily use the chat feature, which a lot of you already have. Thank you. Exciting stuff. Um, you can choose in the chat whether to send it just to the panelists, which will be um, the presenters and myself and Rachel or you can choose to send it to everyone. Now, I encourage you all to send it to everyone unless you have like a technical issue or something you'd like to discuss. Um, Crafty Adults is a social event, so we, we want you to chat. We want you to bring up discussion points. We wanna have a nice, fun social experience while also learning how to do something new. So we encourage you to use the chat feature. Um, we will leave some time at the end of this webinar for a little Q&A. So, once we get to the end, we'll let you know when that Q&A is going to happen, and then feel free to submit some questions in the Q&A. I suppose you can submit them throughout the webinar, just know they may not get answered until the end of the, of the class. Um, you can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to be unmuted at the end during the Q&A and ask your question verbally. That's totally fine, too. So those are our logistics. We're here to, to watch this wonderful presentation. We're going to learn some calligraphy at the end. So I'm so excited to pass this on to Ruthann and Siobhan, who are going to get us started. So Ruthann, it's all you. Hello. Sound good? Yes? I feel like this is an obligatory check at the beginning. Okay, so hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to Laura for the fabulous introduction. Uh, Siobhan and I have a few quick content warnings and pieces of info to share before we begin. Uh, first of all, we will be discussing parchment and quills, which are made from animals. If you would like to step away for these sections, there will be a PowerPoint slide introducing the section. Also in your kits, we included a small square of parchment, which looks like this a quill and an oak gall, which is this little guy right here. Uh, the oak gall does come from wasps. If you would prefer not to handle animal parts or if you may be allergic, uh, please be cautious. 
For the paper, we rolled it so it would fit into the bag, but we highly recommend uh, laying it flat and weighing it down with something heavy. Uh, when you are preparing to use the ink, make sure to have a piece of cardboard or something similar under the paper because the ink will bleed through. <laughs> Uh, finally, we would like to let you know that you are more than welcome to ask questions at any time. Feel free to put a message in chat and we are always happy to answer them. All right, you ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be great, we're so excited. I'm good. Are we okay? Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Okay, so we try to talk. Okay, so we're going to start with a short history of medieval manuscripts. And my uh, first question to you is what is a medieval manuscript? Oh, I guess I should also say please feel free to put your comments or your, your answers in chat so we can, uh, we can see. <laughs> Yeah, everybody feel free to throw their answer in the chat right now. Okay, so I'm seeing a document prepared during the medieval period. Yes. A really old book. Yep. A book, book of Kells is. I love the Book of Kells, by the way. Written by hand. Mm -hmm, they were. Okay, so we're seeing some really great answers, and all of those are essentially what a medieval manuscript is. And one of them even is a medieval manuscript. Um, so if we break down the word into two parts, when we're looking at medieval and we're looking at manuscript, um, when you start talking about the word medieval, any guesses, or not guesses, I guess, but um, what comes to mind with medieval, the word medieval particularly? Knights, Middle Times, War of the Roses, castles, really old, feudalism, Ooh. religion, monks. These are great answers. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of great answers. Vikings. Yeah. So, Hundred Years' War. Yes. All of these are yes. <laughs> great answers. Um, so, if we're getting technical, the medieval period dates from about the 5th century to the late 15th century, which is essentially the 400s to the end of the 1400s. However, if you really want to debate with a medievalist, you can just pick a random date before the Renaissance and claim it as the end point. It's the best part of medievalism. <laughs> okay, so the next word up is manuscript. And what do you think of when I say manuscript? What is a manuscript to you? A book, yep. Written by hand, also yes. Oh, papers bound together, written book with pretty letter. Whoa, you guys are coming fast. Okay, written by hand on vellum. <laughs> Document written by hand, original text of a book. Whoa. Everybody <laughs> answered at once there. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Document. Okay, so yes to all of those as well. <laughs> Um, so another way to think of uh, a manuscript is also, I, it was me mentioned, document written by hand. Um, have, have you written a journal? Do you, do you write in a diary? Have you written a story? Have you written an essay by hand instead of with a computer? And if you've answered yes to any of these questions, then uh, you've made a manuscript. So kind of a fun little thing. Manuscripts, we think of them as being medieval, but they still, they're still around today. We're still making them today. Okay, so to begin to understand how important the development of the book is, I'm gonna start with their precursor, which is scrolls. One second, I'm sorry. Zoom likes to make everything full screen on me and then I have to like find <laughs> everything. I, I know. I'm going to thank everyone in advance for being patient with us because we have a lot of different cameras for this webinar. So we're going to be doing a lot of transitions. So thank you in advance to all thank of you, you for showing us some grace. But 
the fantastic part about some of these technical technical like hiccups is that we're dealing with the actual manuscripts, the actual books here. So there is a little bit of a wait, but it's worth the wait, right? So this is a uh, this is a biblical manuscript for the scroll of Esther. You can see it is a in scroll form, and this one in particular is made out of this one is a parchment. So it's not a papyrus, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so scrolls uh, could be really unwieldy to use um, if you've ever handled a scroll or if you're watching me awkwardly try to open this. Um, you can't uh, just open them or turn the pages like you would with a book. Um, and secondly, you can't, uh, you can't store them on a shelf in the same way that you can store a book. Um, they have to be like rolled up and stacked in order to be able to store them all in the same place which isn't super helpful when users are trying to easily locate and then reach items. And the other issue that you can face with scrolls is that uh, they're difficult to use for reading and writing. So in order to actually use a scroll, you have to unroll one side with one hand, and then you have to simultaneously roll the other side. So I shall demonstrate. So I've unrolled, now to keep going, I need to move this one down and start its curl and it's gonna scroll, it's gonna roll while I'm using my other hand to open the next section. Okay, so I have, uh, both of my hands are now occupied and I hope I don't need to do anything else because this is it for me. Um, but this is also why the writing is in columns uh, because that's the size of the space available at any given time. So right here, you can see where there's a block of text here and then there's a block of text here but there's this divider in the center, that's where the columns are. So you'd hold it like this and you read in a column and that's pretty much how scrolls are. You don't try and read left to right or anything like that. It's, well, I mean, open the scroll the whole time, you get the column. So, and now I'm rolling it back up, which means I'm just doing the opposite. It goes in this way. Ruthann, we have a question for you. Yes. Um, yes. So someone has asked, so you don't need to wear gloves when you're handling the scrolls. Yes, that is a fantastic question. Uh, so when we are working with uh, materials in the Special Collections Library, um, we don't wear gloves when handling most objects because it can, um, it can be problematic when you're trying to turn pages or things like that because you've got you've got a lot of I don't know where's my camera <laughs> you've got a lot of like you know, tactile senses going on in your fingers mm -hmm. and um, it helps you hold things and do it if you've got a glove on you if you ever tried to turn a page where you're wearing like like those knit gloves or it's snowing out and it's cold and you've tried to turn a page in a book you can't quite feel the page right and it's a little difficult to turn that um, if you're doing that with parchment or old paper, anything like that, it's really easy to catch it on the glove or for the glove to leave like thin pieces of fabric or it can just damage the item that you're working with. So that's the reason why we use bare hands, clean bare hands. Yeah, so you do like, wash your hands, my hands are clean. It's like the opposite of what I think most people would think with handling yeah. something so old, which um, I'm going to ask two more questions and then we're going to move on. Yeah. Um, so the document we just looked at, do you know what year that was written? That's a fantastic question, and no, I do not. Do you know what language it was written in? Yes, it's Hebrew. Hebrew, so, okay. Oh, let me go back. I'm going to steal the screen share again. So one of the things that happens a lot when you're working with medieval manuscripts is um, sometimes, most of the time, people don't date what they're working with. So it, it's really hard for you to find a date for it. And the most accurate, I guess not uh, accurate, but the most common way for that to be managed is through paleography, which is the study of handwriting. And you can roughly gauge which century um, or period in time a manuscript is from based upon its handwriting. Um, that's how some of the manuscripts that we're gonna look at today, their date range has been established. It's because of what their handwriting looks like. Um, however, this is in Hebrew, and um, I don't know enough of Hebrew or paleography to be able to date this one. So, unfortunately, I'm not sure about this one. Cool. Thank you so much, Ruthann. You you know so much. <laughs> and thank you you all for asking the questions. I, I really appreciate it. I think it's going to be fun to hear the rest of your questions throughout this. Okay. So... 
so the two images that we're looking at now are examples of people holding a scroll. Um, on the left, the person is standing with the scroll open, so kind of a little bit similar to what I was doing, hands very much occupied. Um, and on the right, the person is seated with a scroll and the scroll's open on their lap. And this is uh, the position that you would most often be in when you're writing. Uh, desks weren't really the common thing that they are now. So a lot of the time you'd end up writing on your lap. Um, I also want to quickly point out that scrolls were made of papyrus, uh, which comes from a plant, which you can see on the screen here. And um, it's pretty commonly known to come from Egypt. However, when parchment became a thing, um, scrolls, I mean, as we saw, can also be made from parchment, uh, and we'll be touching on the parchment making process in just a few more minutes. All right, next up we're going to talk about monks and monasteries. And um, so we're talking about making books rather than scrolls now. And just a quick question, uh, monks and nuns, when, when, I, when I start using those words, what do y'all think? What comes to mind? Habits, abbeys, holy people, religious men and women, Catholicism, monasteries, yep. Yeah, exactly. Monks and nuns. So I am sure this comes as no, so oh, hey, book of hours and a scriptorium. Has someone been looking at my PowerPoint presentation? Because <laughs> this is, uh... <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Uh, monks, um, as no surprise, uh, are men who devoted themselves to religious learning and activities, and nuns are women who did the same thing, devoted themselves to religious learning and activities. Uh, monasteries are where only monks live, and they practice and learn their chosen religious information. Uh, a nunnery is where only nuns live, and then abbey is uh, like a co-ed, it's where both monks and nuns live. Uh, the earliest manuscripts were made by monks who were dedicating the beautiful books and the work they put into them to God. They viewed their creations as a means of devotion. So in the monastery, there is a specific place that monks could go to to spend time working on their creations, which was the scriptorium. Uh, the image here is the plan of the St. Gaul Monastery from between about 820 and 830. Now, not all monasteries had a scriptorium, but if they were large enough to have the dedicated space, this is what they looked like. So the image on the left is a more detailed image where you can see the, the large squares, which are the desks, and then the double lines marking the windows. Uh, so any guesses as to why the double lines are in between each of the desks? Seen for light needed this light to see, to use a spotty electrical supply, yes, <laughs> <laughs> wind, <laughs> windows, sorry, these are some great answers, <laughs> but yes, uh, candles are dangerous paper, um, but uh, at this time, they, um, of course, there's no electricity, so you need natural light to be able to see what you're doing. So I, it makes sense, you know, desk next to the window. Um, I don't know if you have ever tried to write anything uh, by candlelight at night, but it's not exactly conducive to eye health or preventing a migraine. So uh, it's not recommended. Uh, monks and uh, nuns would also go outside to write as well. So it wasn't just inside the scriptorium. Oh, okay. And one last point about uh, monks and manuscript production. Uh, they could be uh, really, really slow. Uh, monks didn't make books because it was their job. Uh, they did it as a form of worship. Uh, many times when people think of medieval manuscripts, uh, they associate them with monks and monasteries However, this isn't entirely accurate. In the 12th century, the university system was developed, which enabled people to receive training to be a scribe, and you didn't need to be associated with the church. So in other words, uh, scribes could be secular. And as a result, manuscript production moved from just being in the monasteries to also being a trade. 
Uh, professional scribes were paid for their labor rather than their time, which meant it paid to be fast. However, there is evidence that scribal contracts required that the scribe's work be just as good as the exemplar. Um, an exemplar is a sample, like the little sample book you put together to show people your skill set. Uh, and then not only, so not only did they have to be fast, but they also needed to be able to produce quality work. All right, the last point about scribes is the image on the right. What details can you guys see and what, what do you think is going on here? Or what do you think is important about this? I'm saying, okay, well, I saw something about a knife. Are they children? The scribe is using both hands. Is he lining his pages? They started young. A lot of contrast. Well, sorry, this is coming real fast. <laughs> Orange Take your person. time. Screen share. They started young. Well, well sorry, my chat's moving. <laughs> <laughs> it's moving so oh, quickly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There's... Okay. <laughs> The scribe teaching apprentices, it looks almost like an auction, uh, taking notes from a conversation. Okay. So, yes, this is a scribe uh, teaching and apprent apprentices. Um, and, oh, hey, yes, this is a woman. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, this, I wanted to point out that scribes were not just men at this time, that women also participated in this trade. And as you can see from the image, she's also teaching the like, next generation of scribes as well. So very important to note. And um, yes, the scribe is using a knife um, and it's like in her left hand and she's got the quill in the right hand. Um, the, the knife that she is using, uh, you can use a knife, we'll get more into this when we get to the quills and the calligraphy, but you can use a knife to uh, shave down your quill so it stays sharp. And also if you're writing on parchment and you mess up, you gotta scrape it off. So it's a, like a two-pronged tool. Were the students both male and female? Probably both. It's a little hard to tell from this picture because you only really get the first two and then a head, half a head in the background, but yes, you, you would have had both at this time. Okay, this is Siobhan. Um, now that we've learned uh, a little bit about manuscripts and scriptoriums, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about one of the earliest writing tools um, that we have. So, before we had sharpies and fountain pens and and uh, the like, we had our fingers. But one of the oldest writing tools is actually found in Egypt, and it's the reed pen. Um, these reed pens were used beginning in the fourth century, um, and they come from the same papyrus plants that were used to create a papyrus that we saw a little bit earlier. Um, in order to create these reeds, they were carved into a squarish tip in water. It needed to be in water in order to soften it enough so that it could be properly carved. Um, not only, if anyone could see me, I have a little reed pen right here. And not only did the hollow interior, it helped to create like a reservoir for the ink to sit. Um, yeah, that's what it did. But it was also kind of nice because in the creation of the reed pens and the papyrus, they were able to use a lot more of the plant, which we love a we love a circular situation. Um, eventually, this is it became way too labor intensive <laughs> to use the reed pens. It's really really difficult to keep the tip of them square and sharp. Um, and also, if every time you need to use a pen, you have to go find a body of water to sit in and start scraping at it with a knife, it takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of time. So people really sort of tried to find some other tools they could use. Um, which brings us to the quill. So actually the quill was used as far back as the second century, but it wasn't really popular until about the seventh century. Um, however, it has been used since the 19th century. Uh, frankly, many people still use quills today for everyday writing, um, but most often for different forms of uh, intricate calligraphy. 
Um, in order to create quills, uh, feathers were plucked, dried, scraped, and then carved with a sharp knife. The strongest quills derive from the primary flight feathers of birds like geese, crows, and eagles. The quills, if you pull out your quills out of your thing, I believe these are turkey feathers though. We use turkey feathers in order to give you all the quills that you will be using for your calligraphy lesson later. Um, but again, goose feathers were actually the most common, but if you wanted to get really large lettering, make it real, real fancy, uh, people would use swan feathers. However, again, that was for if you wanted to be real fancy. Um, now, the you can tell if your quill is left or right-handed. Um, so the feather from the left wing would be chosen because it lays well over, if you can kind of see my hand, it lays across the right of your hand, which means that you can also have a left-handed one, which would be the right wing of the, the right wing of the bird. Um, unfortunately, we only gave you all right-handed quills. <laughs> uh, if you shoot us an email, we could figure something out. I think we have a couple lefties um, hanging out in the crowd somewhere. Um, now, the tip of the feather was cut to a little bit of a nib, which you can see um, in the present in the, the slide. It was cut, it was sliced with a knife and then cut into and cut into sort of a bit of a curve, not the same sort of flat shape that you would get with the reed pen, but more of an almost point. And even then, sometimes we would clip it a little bit more square. But there is this little nib that you put into it. Which helps to make the um, which helps to make the quill sort of be able to push in a little bit and have a little bit more flexibility as you're moving across the page. It also is how you and I think uh, <laughs> Carrie will talk about this later. It also sort of helps you to get um, shorter and larger um, lines as you're making the quills. Okay, so next up is parchment. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that parchment comes after papyrus, but um, what exactly is parchment? What do you guys think? Sheep skin, animal skin, lots of animal skin, prepared animal skin. Yep, you said it earlier. Did I give it away earlier? Cured animal skin. Ooh. All right, so I'm not the best at keeping secrets, apparently. <laughs> uh, paper made from animal. <laughs> all right, so yes, these these are all, <laughs> they all come. Uh, parchment is made from animals. Apparently I said this earlier, <laughs> sorry. All right, so uh, parchment is made from the skin of animals. It's typically a uh, cow, pig, goat, and sheep. In normal usage, uh, Parchment and vellum are kind of interchangeable, but uh, they can mean the same thing. But if you want to be really specific, though, they do refer to different species. Um, vellum, when strictly defined, refers to the skin from young calves. Okay, so we're going to go through um, the use of parchment. <laughs> Uh, the first step, if you're going to make uh, parchment, is you got to select good skins. Mm -hmm. uh, the color of the animal does influence the color of the parchment. So like white sheep makes white parchment, or like if you have a goat that has like a spot, it's going to, the parchment is going to reflect the spot at the end of the product. Um, also, an animal with minimal bug bites and other imperfections makes the most unblemished because those bug bites are going to show up in your parchment. Okay, so here we go. This is going to be a lot of words flying at you, but we're going we're gonna to do this. Okay, so we're going to cover the actual process of making parchment, and it's going to be the step-by-step -step process. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to wash the skin in cold, clear water for a day and a night or until it's clean. Uh, then you're going to loosen the hair. It's uh, usually artificially induced by soaking the skin in wooden or stone vats in a solution of lime and water for about three to 10 days. Uh, the vats also need to be stirred several times a day uh, with a giant wooden pole. Uh, this can be done naturally by laying out the skins as well, um, but it's gonna take a whole bunch of time longer. This is already a lengthy process um, and the process will take longer in winter. It's always better to leave the skin in that solution longer than it is too short. 
And then the skins are scooped out individually and laid over the beam, which is a large curved upright shield of wood. And you'll see that in the next one. Uh, the parchmenter then stands behind the beam and he leans forward over the top and then that scrapes the hair off with a long curved knife with a wooden handle on each end. And then the hair sloughs onto the ground and leaves behind the pink or the lighter skin. And then when possible, the outer film was scraped away as well. So this is an image of that parchmenter. You can see that the skin is on top of that beam. It looks like a, that shield, like up into pointing into the middle of his torso. And then he's got the blade with both hands and he's scraping down. After the hair has been peeled, the skin is sometimes put back into the vat of lime. Uh, then the skin is flipped over on the beam so that the inside is facing up and then the parchmenter can begin the process of scraping off the flesh side as well. Now, if you push too hard, the knife can cut through the skin, which does lower the value, the future value of the parchment. Uh, the skin is cleaned and then rinsed for two more days in clear water, uh, clean water in order to remove the lime. In the second phase, uh, the skin is stretched taut on a frame and dried. Uh, the image on the right is what it looks like when it's stuck in that frame. The frame can be a hoop or it can be rectangular. Uh, the skin, however, cannot be nailed to the frame because as the, as the skin dries, it's gonna shrink and then the edges around it are gonna tear. Um, as the skin, uh, the skin is suspended by those strings that you see around the edges and it's got little adjustable pegs so that you can adjust the width as it dries. And then there's little nubs, like extra balls of extra parchment rolled up on the inside so that the, the strings can attach to those instead of the parchment itself. And then as the skin dries, any flaws in the skin will be pulled out into circular or oval holes, but if they are caught in time, they can be stitched, like stitch them together. So once on the frame, the parchment keeps the skin wet initially by putting ladles of hot water on the skin. And then the parchmenter is gonna scrape the skin with a lunellum. There'll be a picture of that on the next slide, which is a crescent shaped knife. I bet you guys can guess why it's called lunellum, like luna, like moon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, then they constantly adjust the pegs and the string. So it's really important to use that uh, lunellum because an ordinary knife would have the sharp edges on the side and you could cut the, uh, the parchment, which of course is gonna lower your value. So there's a picture of the lunellum and you can see it kind of looks like the, the half-shaped crescent moon. So the skin is then set aside to dry and when dry, the parchmenter scrapes the skin again with the lunellum. And the amount of scraping at this point kind of determines on the fineness of the parchment that you would like. The more scrapes, the finer the parchment. However, you can literally have one scrape too many. If that parchmenter just does one scrape too much, he'll ruin the entire thing and go straight through it. So it's a real mark of how good of a parchmenter you are if you know where the line is, because then you can sell the most expensive parchment. Okay, so then the parchment can be removed from the frame and it can either be rolled up and stored or taken to, <laughs> to be sold. Sorry, I'm loving these comments, by the way. They're great. Okay, so I am going to swap to, so this is just an image with an example of one of the holes, but I'm gonna swap to the share screen and I'm gonna show you some parchment. Okay, so please ignore my, all right, so can we all see these little squares? These are the squares of parchment that uh, you've kind of got, everyone has in their kits, okay? So if you take them and you're holding them and you hold them like this and you've got a finger on each side and you're kind of feeling each side, um, you can, there's a difference. You should be able to feel a difference on either side. How, how are we doing? Are we feeling, feeling any difference? So uh, one side is smoother and one side's a bit rougher. Wait, how are we feeling? Great. <laughs> Well, awkwardly asking people if they can rub the parchment. <laughs> um, yes, we're seeing some yeses and I never knew about this parchment. One side smooth, one side soft. Any guesses as to which is which? Like which side is skin side and which side is flesh side? Oh, I guess I should, skin side is the side that has the fur, like on the, the external side and 
uh, flesh side is the side that would have been facing on the inside. Well, I lost the chat. One oh, <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, smooth skin side, fuzzy side, a skin side, the rough side. Yeah, that's completely right because you can't quite get rid of all of those little hair follicles. And I'm not sure the camera can pick up what's happening here. But if you look closely at some of them, you can still kind of see the hair follicles in here. It depends on the animal too. Um, I find that pig is a lot easier for me to identify because the, the, like the pores, the follicles are a lot bigger. So it's easier to see. But yeah, if you look under a mic, if you happen to have a microscope or a magnifying glass at home, they're really cool to look at. <laughs> um, so before we wrap up with parchment, there are two more pieces of information that I wanted to share with you all. Um, so we talked about how in, during this time period, people used everything. And so they're using all the parts of the animals at this time. So if they're using a sheep, they're going to use every aspect of that. And then the parchment is part of that. So they're gonna use it all. Also, modern science has progressed and it's great. And so when a scientist looks at the DNA that you can still find in parchment because it's, it's animal skin, uh, they can actually tell what the different species are and um, they can tell how many different species are in a book. So like each page, you could check and see which species it is. And turns out parchment is just parchment. So typically it doesn't, as long as it looks like parchment, it goes in and it's not like this book has to be made entirely of sheep or cow or anything like that. So I thought that was kind of cool. Parchment is parchment. All right, you guys ready for, we have more questions. Which came first, the parchment or the papyrus? Uh, papyrus came first. Uh, papyrus was made from the reed plant that grows in Egypt, and Egypt was Egypt was really uh, doing well off of the sale of uh, papyrus. <laughs> the parchment doesn't seem as conducive to rolling up a scroll. Yes, um, that's part of the reason why um, when parchment became more in common use. Uh, parchment is much more durable than papyrus. Papyrus is really easy to break. It can be really hard to write on because your writing, it's not a smooth surface. So parchment is more durable. It's easier to write on. You can do more things with it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, do that. Okay, what animal did you say we have? Oh, y'all have goat. And if you are curious, um, it was ordered from Pergamena, which is P-E-R-G-A-M-E-N-A. -E -E and they are, um, I think they're in upstate New York, but they're an American-based parchment company. They do great work and they sell, you can buy it by the roll or you can buy like individual sheets of um, parchment if you're interested in that. Which side do you write on? Write on both sides, <laughs> all the sides. <laughs> um, so, there is, um, in some of the books you'll see, not this particular one I have up, but um, if you're familiar with looking at a book that has super wide, super white margins, it means that that book's got money because the wider and the whiter your margins are, it means the more money you had to be able to spend on that parchment. Typically, you would, here, you know what, I'm just going to show you. Typically, you find writing that goes the entire um, width of the page because you want to use up all of the real estate. So this was in, this is a Latin poetry and um, it was for, for students. So you're getting like this stuff in the center, like learning in the center and then the commentary on the side and then the notes. So you want to use up all of the stuff. Um, but if you've got white and white, some money was dumped on it. All right. Did we get all the parchment questions? Good. Okay. So what I want to show you about this one that I think is particularly cool. Oh, hey, and I opened right to the right page. That is perfect. I love this book. Okay, so I mentioned that this was in use for students, which means that it's going to be a bit more rough and tumble than something that you're going to be using because it's this prestigious item. Um, so the parchment that's being used in here is, um, well, it's not as white <laughs> and it's not as flat. <laughs> and, you know, it's got some, some stuff happening here. But that was okay because it's a learning tool, not necessarily something to show off how awesome this is. And this is an example of, if you can, we can all see this. 
Um, if you look right here, let me zoom in. If you look right here, you can see that there's um, a break in the parchment mm -hmm. and it's been stitched together. So the same way that you'd have like now a doctor with sutures, same idea. You're stitching the skin in the same method and you just stitch it up and you keep on going. The other one that I wanted to show you is over here. It's another example of that same thing. So this hole in the parchment was something that would have been there originally from maybe the animal had a wound or there was a bug bite or the parchment here just got a little overzealous. Um, but you see how the words, they don't stop. Like it's not, the words just move on. Like it's, they're just skipping over it and moving on, which is an indicator that it was there before the writing was there, but also that it's perfectly fine. And then there's more stitches up at the top. So this was a well-loved book and here is the outside of it, but it served its purpose, which was to teach Latin to students. Okay, now the next one I'm gonna get for you is... Was there an occupation then for the stitcher? Mm, the, oh, the parchmenter would just, the parchmenter would just stitch it. Okay, sorry, I missed all these questions, okay. Surgery on your textbook. <laughs> I could not imagine surgery. Okay, what were those little pinholes along the side? I am so glad you asked, and I hope you don't mind, but I'm gonna nerd out and y'all are gonna come with me. <laughs> okay, so when you're writing a manuscript on parchment, you can see that there's no lines, right? It's not like the like the notebook paper that you buy at the store where um, it comes like pre-lined for you, but you can see, let me see, oh, this is a good one. Can we see? In between these lines, I don't, it might be too faint, the pencil mark, but there are lines underneath of the, the text. We can, can see it. Can see in this? Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, we can see it. Right, so that's rubrication. And if you can see down here, you can see like the, like the rectangles that it's making. Okay, so that is how the lines were made. So before you started like actually writing in the, on the parchment, you would rubricate, like you'd make the grid of all the lines where you're gonna write. And one of the ways to do that, oh, here it is. You can see these, hold on, move over. Okay, can we see the pinholes on the side right here? Can we see, okay. So one of the ways that you could do this is you'd stick like a knife or like a sharp object like that into this and you'd have the string across it and then that would be able to mark how your lines were straight. Excuse me. And if you did a whole stack of these, you could just stick your sharp object in and do a whole stack and press the line in and so that the line would go through all of them. So that's how they helped line the pages. Yeah. <laughs> I love medieval manuscripts. Okay. Any other questions about this one? How old how, is the first? Yeah, how old? This one. Thirteenth or fourteenth century from England. So this is also one of those situations where um, it is a textbook, so it's going to be used by a lot of different people. Um, and if you look at it, it's got a lot of different hands, um, different handwritings. Um, so this would have been, the attempt would have been made to date this based upon some of the different handwriting styles uh, and what century they belong to, which is why you get such a big date range. Okay, you ready for the next one? Okay. So before we start with this one, I want to tell you that this is a facsimile. And a facsimile is an exact replica of an item. And this is an exact replica of a medieval manuscript that there's only three, well, uh, there's only one of this, but there's only three like it in the world. Um, so a facsimile is, is a really good way to be able to um, experience it and have uh, be able to have firsthand knowledge of what's going on in here. So this is called the Black Hours, and it's a facsimile of M.493, which is held by the Morgan Library in New York. And the original one, not this one, but the original, was made around 1475 in Belgium. And the cool part about this one, 
all the leaves are black. <laughs> um, so, um, so in order to help the writing stand out against the black parchment, only white lead and opaque paints were used for the miniatures, which are Now I can't find any miniatures. Oh, here we go, which are these guys right here. Um, and the they also use gold and silver for the ink. So this is a good example if you can see the gold on the first lines and then silver, and then there's a gold word down at the bottom. And like I said before, there's only three black out like black parchment manuscripts in the world. So um, the parchment doesn't it, the because of the black, it doesn't age as well as the other parchment. So the process to make it is really costly and you can mess it up really easily. It's quite delicate. Um, the first step is after you've you know, made your parchment, you immerse it in an iron copper solution, which is what stains it black. And then, um, but the staining does make it fragile and brittle, which is why there's only three of them left. And then after you've stained it, then you send it off to be illustrated and illuminated and finished off with the, the silver and the gold ink. Okay, so one of the questions, does the, the black parchment come, oh no, it come, it, originally it would look like normal, like the parchment squares that you have in your, in your kits. Um, this is uh, stained after it has already been done. Name, this is called the black hours. Um, if you want to look at, um, I think the Morgan has this digitized. Um, if you want to look at it, um, the original online, uh, we can put the call number into the chat and then you'll be able to, you can just search it through the Morgan Library's digital collections. Do the metals actually end up oxidizing? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's part of the reason why it doesn't do too well um, because it kind of like tears through <laughs> the poor parchment. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not super friendly to it. <laughs> the column is. All right. Oh, hey, we've got the link. Thank you. Okay. All right. Did I miss any of the, the the questions for the black parchment? I think you got them all. Fantastic. Yeah. So, here's another example of the miniature. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I'm not sure. That's okay. <laughs> Siobhan took over. Okay. <laughs> what yeah. did they stain it with? Do you want to take it back? Okay, I'm gonna take it back. What did they stain it with? Um, <laughs> I wrote it down. Iron copper. Yes, it's iron copper. Uh, what am I? I'm. Sorry, I had to. There's a lot of clicking to take it back. <laughs> Um, also on this one, um, the outside is kind of a velvety texture. I don't think you can see that, uh, but it does have um, the hardware on the outside and it has a clasp right here. And fun little trivia, I'm just gonna, you guys are gonna learn all the trivia. Um, a lot, most of the time when you're making a uh, manuscript that has parchment in it, you would get this clasp here because parchment comes from animals, right? <laughs> And when parchment is left out in weather, especially anything that's humid or there's moisture, it likes to curl back up into the shape of the animal. You can kind of see it when we were looking at the Latin poetry book, the parchment had bits of waves going through it. Um, so what they would do is they put the clasp on because the pressure that the clasp is providing when it's being kept closed helps keep the parchment flat and helps it store better. It also prevents damage and some other stuff happening to it. So that's why you see clasps a lot of the time. And if not a clasp, at least the hardware that you knew there was a clasp there once upon a time. Okay. All right, did they use the black so the gold and silver would show up better? Um, sort of, but more like the other way around. Uh, the black uh, was the original intent and then the gold and silver was so you could actually read it. Um, for this particular item, man, it's, it's based off a monarch <laughs> and the reasoning, oh, it's a Louis. I'm really bad with my monarchs, but it's one of the monarchs in Europe. And he went into mourning when his dad died and he became the king and he wore black for a really long period of time. 
Um, and it became fashionable to wear black. So the court started wearing black and the nobility started wearing black, like all the, everyone was wearing black all the time. And in order to reflect that fashion trend, um, the black hours, because books at this time, books of this level, this quality um, were status symbols. And uh, you carried a book of hours with you. They were personal things that you carried. And so they started dyeing them black to reflect the, the trend of the time being everything black. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, thank you so much for saying that. that was beautiful. I love the black hours. Um, uh, what exactly is a book of hours? That is a fantastic question. Um, yeah, I'm gonna let you do that one. Okay. Um, so a book of hours is, it's a personal devotional book essentially. And um, they are, they're, they're typically smaller, so they're portable and they're something that are easy to carry. And they're um, essentially the prayers that you say at certain times of the day. Okay, so I'm going to go further back. So when you're in a monastery, um, monks typically go and pray at certain times of the day and night. And you would go, like the bell tolls, you go and you pray and you do the, the thing. It's a very uh, structured schedule. If you aren't living a religious life, like you're living like out in the world, um, a way to... Um, improve the devotion to, to show that you're being devoted is to have that book of hours. So you can go and pray at those set times and you know what prayers to use and those types of things. And uh, you don't have to be in a monastery for that to do it. Uh, more fun trivia for you. Um, books of hours are mostly associated with women. So um, they were something that women carried a lot of. You can tell this, there's a lot of, um, like pictures of the owners in the books of hours and they were mostly women. Um, and also um, they, oh my goodness, where were they? Double family books. Yes, so thank you. <laughs> they get passed down <laughs> through the generation. So it's something that you, you would pass on to your kids um, or give your daughter as like um, a bridal gift or the birth of a child kind of gift to your kid or something like that. That's a book of hours. It's so good to have a medievalist. <laughs> so good to have a medievalist. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the inks, pigments, and uh, the gold leaf that pop up around. So um, these are examples of Chinese ink sticks. Uh, so I think it's important to say that almost every ancient culture uh, created some form of an ink by combining basically two big things. Um, something to give the ink a color and something to bind it together like a glue. Um, so the ink that the ink sticks that we're looking at right now are from China. And so a lot most ink, mo what we think of as modern ink um, comes from China. Uh, it would have this sort of ink would have uh, existed probably in the, the seventh century in China um, because uh, there was an art of brush painting with ink that was seen as sort of a necessary skill for upper class people, but also um, regarded as a high art for those who were skilled at brush painting. Those people would be considered like scholars, philosophers, they were really important. Um, but although this kind of ink and painting style began in China, many other East Asian cultures um, learned it um, sort of spread around through different missionary <laughs> trips and then created their own versions. So the ink we are looking at right now is known as sumi ink. Um, how many folks have heard of sumi ink if you've ever done like Japanese calligraphy? Maybe. Yay! It's still quite popular, <laughs> but it also, it, it, it it comes from China. It derives from the Chinese ink making. Um, so it's a little bit after the seventh century. Um, so this particular kind of ink would have been made from a mixture of soot, most likely pine soot because pine trees were so uh, available in Japan during this period, um, bone glue, <laughs> um, and sometimes a uh, uh, a perfume, just to give it a little extra zhuzh. Uh, so the mixture would be kneaded into a ball 
and then shaped with the wooden frame that you see in the second picture. Um, after it's shaped um, and pressed, it would be hung up using different sorts of reeds and straw that they had um, so that that so that they can be dried. Now, similar to the parchment, this is not like a two day drying process. <laughs> um, this the drying out of this material. Oh, yeah, the drying out of this material could take weeks, sometimes even months, um, because it is important. And you can kind of see from the fourth picture on the right. Um, it was really important to make sure you got all the moisture out because this particular glue, I mean, this particular ink is water soluble. So if it, once it touches water, ooh, baby, baby, you are covered in ink. <laughs> so you really got to make sure you got that moisture out. Now, once you actually have, and I have a little ink stick right here with me. Once you actually have your nice dried out ink stick, what you would do is that you would get a grinding stone. And so if you kind of look at the picture, the grinding stone is going to be slightly tilted with a little sort of space to hold the ink. And you just put a little bit of water on there and you just grind down until you have the ink. Um, and then you would use usually like a horsehair brush um, in order to actually make the designs and writing or whatever you're using it for, whether you're painting or not. Can you show that? Yes, I can show the ink stick. <laughs> There you go. And someone put it in the um, chat, but yes, you can absolutely go to the store and buy this today. You can, it is very, very easy to, again, like I, like I said, um, Sumi ink is still incredibly popular <laughs> and used all the time. Um, and it is still considered a great art to be able to do Japanese calligraphy. So I'm a big fan. Um, oh, but what is bone glue? Hmm, how do I? <laughs> uh, so back in the day, you could not buy Elmer's. Um, <laughs> you could not buy Elmer's. So what you would do is that you would um, you would get some bones from from poor little animals, usually a horse or something, um, and uh, you kind of boil it down until you get all the all that marrow out and then you get like a real fun sticky thing um they we kind of stopped using this kind of glue a while back but frankly not long enough ago <laughs> because if anyone um if anyone has ever found like an old um like an old scrapbook um like early 20th century, if you ever found an old scrapbook and you you can sort of peel, you can start to peel off some of the pictures, maybe they're coming off a little bit, it's really common with scrapbooks, and you see like this brown stuff that's sticking together, baby, baby, that's the bone glue. Um, and because it is made of bone and it is an animal product, it is important to know that um, um, those areas can get quite moldy because mold will eat, honestly, honestly anything but they really really like that old school glue um <laughs> hopefully you don't you will not need any bone glue anytime soon um, i hope um but i i always think it's important to mention that like i said many cultures have their own form of ink however not every culture has what we would think of as a written tradition that involves paper or books um, many indigenous cultures um such as the maori and the fulani <laughs> There's no date for the bone glue session. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I am basically a vegetarian. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, but many indigenous cultures like the Maori and the Fulani have an oral tradition, and, but however would also use tattoos to mark family affiliations, passages of time, victories, major milestones in life, and many other reasons. And although these traditions are oral when we consider the passing down of that history, um, it is actually not super different from the way that um, other cultures have used animal skin to share their stories. So I always like to make sure that, that also gets included. 
oftentimes the writing, it, it, it really does depend. People were, um, like I said, there's two basic components, which is something like a pigment and then a glue. You would not necessarily put glue into your body though. <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily get the binder unless it's maybe like a really natural one. Um, but typically for tattooing, you would use some kind of um, soot that you have from burning soot or charcoal or whatever you have. And then I guess it would also be when you kind of, there's lots of different ways to do tattooing. Some of them are with um, wooden sticks, some of them with like bones, different sort of pointy bones. There's a really popular, well, I wouldn't say popular. <laughs> there's a really um, amazing practice that happens in I believe Japan where, and I think there's a couple other cultures where it's a, like a wooden, wooden stick um, with a bone in it and you just hit, like you just bang the stick and you hit it. I think there's only one woman who still actually does that form of tattooing if you really wanna take a little trip. Um, but I do think it's important to just remember that even though we're talking about um, books, this is still a form of manuscript making. This is still a really important form of um, passing down history. So um, meanwhile in Europe, <laughs> Uh, ink was created using uh, a combination of material from global trade and things that you could easily find at home. So here is a recipe from an ink that was made in London. Um, can any of you recognize a single word? It's super blurry. So I'm just, actually, I'm just gonna read it to you. <laughs> it says to make ink. I don't know what that word means. <laughs> I don't know what that word says, but you would use, it says a half something of um, it's like vittle and a gram of yucker. Basically, <laughs> basically, it, it means it, it's just telling you that you would use um, to make ink. You would use um, a vitriol, which is actually um, copper, uh, iron sulfate. Um, it's like a copper, which is actually very, very similar to the um the wash that would have happened for those black um for the for that black parchment um you're still using that iron sulfate or copper it's also like an iron copper wash um so that and uh a gall do people know what a gall is you can hold it up you have one in your bag does anyone know what a gall is let's see anyone have a guess as to, as to what this is you thought it was a chickpea. Very fair. Very fair. I too am hungry. Um, something waspy growth from a tree caused by parasites. These are all really, these are all really, really great. Many insects make galls. This is correct. Um, so in the case of the, again, we also kind of ruined a little bit because we had to give you a warning. <laughs> um, but in this case, this is a gall that would have been made from a, an oak it's called an oak wasp. Um, so this is a female wasp that um, lays her eggs into sort of the like the seams of an oak tree's leaves. So you can kind of see it in the pictures um, here, these like little spots. That's what they kind of look like. I think a lot of people start to think that they are like fruits that are appearing, but they're not. Oh, yay! I love a, I love a gall. Someone studied galls here. Um, um, but the thing is that these little galls, um, when, when the larva starts to like hatch on the leaves, the, the chemical reaction causes this little hard thing to open, up uh, to form on there. And a lot of people think that they're like little fruits, but they're not. Um, you only have one little wasp baby per gall. And for some folks, it may be a little harder to see, but when it's all ready to come out, you'll see like a little bitty hole. <laughs> that little, some of you have little bitty holes, some people have bigger holes, like little holes, um, but that's like where the little waspy would come out from. Okay, so the other thing, like I mentioned a bit, is copperus, um, which is an iron sulfate. Um, or a green uh, vitriol. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, now that is something kind of similar to a salt that would have been used and it's typically gonna be green. However, um, you're probably like, where where do they even get this? That's a great question. I don't really know. However, <laughs> however, something that was actually way more commonly used, way, way more commonly used was what 
which is that during the process of making the ink, people would literally just throw a nail, just like throw an iron nail just to give it a little stuff. Uh, give it a little extra. And then uh, gum Arabic would also often have been used, um, which is actually um, native to Africa, specifically Sudan most of the time, um, and is again a part of the global trade, which is the creation of these different kinds of ink. Now, in order to make this ink, there's actually a couple ways, and I would strongly encourage you all to try a couple at home. It's really fun to make ink. So there's one way that takes, that takes like maybe an hour or so, and that is you get your galls together, you go forage a bunch of galls, um, you put them in a pot, a pot of water, um, and you just let that boil. You just boil that up for a really, really long time until all the tannins, um, which is the, the thing that gives them sort of their brown color, sort of seep out into the, uh, into the solution that you're making. Um, and then what you can do is if you have an iron, like a like an iron nail, you can toss that in. It will make the color even darker. The chemical reaction um, of the water, the air, and the iron makes it rust, so it makes it a little bit darker. Or you can add um, the coppers that you have. Uh, fun, fun fact. Um, you can buy iron sulfate at the store. You can go, you can go buy it today. It is actually a very common plant fertilizer. And I have a, and I have a big bag at my house. Um, if you're in Champaign and you really want some coppers, um, some copper sulfate, um, you really want it. Um, so that's one way is the boiling. The other way to do it is you can just sort of sit at home. You just get like a cup or some kind of container, put a bunch of oak galls in there and, and, and water, and you just let that sit for a really, really long time until all that brown has sort of leached. Yes, you can, you can make ink. So this is where I want you to see if you can try it, if you want to have a really good time. You can make ink out of walnuts. Walnut shells actually make really, really good. <laughs> walnuts make really good um, ink. I've made ink with acorns. This is actually the first time we're teaching this um, uh, during the fall. <laughs> so like y'all could go out tomorrow. Y'all could go out tomorrow, start gathering some things up. Uh, before winter hits, and you can make your own little inks. Um, now, if you're going to do the boil method, you're gonna want to add uh, once you have so once you have your solution of water and the oak galls and tannins or whatever. What you're gonna do is that then you're gonna add your sticky thing. Um, so that could be gum arabic, which you can get from the store. However, if you want to be really, really historically accurate. Um, you could go, you could use, uh, uh, basically anything. Yeah, you can fight the squirrels for the acorns. You can use basically anything. Um, people back in the day use whatever sticky thing they could find. So sometimes they, if you have bone glue, which, you know, that's your business. Um, if you have some bone glue and you want to make it out of that, go for it. A really common thing that was used to bind, uh, bind ink, uh, during the medieval period was honey. If you can get a hold of some honey and it wasn't too much of a fuss, um, and wine. Wine was often used, although I don't think it binded anything really. I think they just, I think they just wanted to give it like a nice little reddish color or, um, it's important. Ink making was oftentimes, uh, once we leave the monasteries, ink making was oftentimes the responsibility of women in the kitchen. So they were just throwing stuff in there. They were just, they were throwing just anything they had on hand right on in there. Um, but that's, but I honestly, I would strongly encourage people to make ink. It is very, very fun. Um, and Ruthann sort of touched on this a bit. So uh, uh, in talking about the black hours. So these are two images of um, what happens <laughs> when you use iron gall ink. Yes, it was very, very popular um, until the 19th century. I mean, people still use it, but mostly for like educational things. Um, and it is because of what I'm about to show you. So here you, on the right, on the left, you have the Opus Galli, um, by, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, which is actually, uh, a manuscript that we have here at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Um, in it, Sir Isaac Newton is attempting to create the Philosopher's Stone, not the one from Harry Potter, not the one from Harry Potter, I promise. Um, at the time, it was he was trying to create it so that um, during this period, there was not really much of a distinction between alchemy and like what we think of as hard science. And so he was trying to <laughs> create something that would turn basically anything into gold. Um, he was not successful, but <laughs> it has a really, really beautiful item. So one of the 
One of the things we are currently trying to fix and working with uh, conservators to do is that this, um, this particular document has a lot of damage to it because if people can get in the chat, what happens when iron gets wet, gets dried out? <laughs> what does it do? What's it start doing? Gets a little oxidized. What's it start doing? Yeah, baby, it starts rusting. <laughs> It starts rusting, rusting, rusting. And kind of what, um, again, what Ruthann touched on, when it starts to rust, paper cannot pa paper can't hold up. It can't do it, it cannot hold up. And so it literally starts to like eat through the paper. So the example on the right shows you this really, this something that happens when it's a really, really severe damage. Not foxing, foxing is also oxidation, but it's not, um, it's just happening within the, the paper itself. It's just the paper reacting sort of to itself in the air. Whereas this ink is literally eating through <laughs> the paper. Um, and you get this, I think it's kind of beautiful. It's sad for the manuscripts, but it's absolutely gorgeous to look at. You get these really extreme examples of haloing where, <laughs> where the ink eats so deeply into uh, the paper that it will leave just like emptiness where the where the writing would be but i think it's pretty but the rare book and manuscript they're trying to actually um make it so that it doesn't they're trying to stabilize it because you can't reverse it but you can try your best <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about um pigment folks here we can. The wonderfully brilliant jewel-like colours in many medieval manuscripts came from animal, vegetable and mineral sources. Mineral sources to note are ultramarine, which is over the sea, coming from that brilliant blue of lapis lazuli. And that can often be confused with citramarine, this side of the sea, or azurite, uh, which is a slightly greener blue. An iron-based compound was rubrica, uh, a lovely red colour, and this was used for the headings or the instructions in books, and from this we get rubrics. Minium comes from baking flake white to give an orangey red as here, and it was used to outline the medieval miniatures, and because they were outlined in minium, they were called miniatures. They weren't called miniatures because they were small, as they weren't always small. Dragon's blood is a mixture, as everybody surely knows, between a dragon and an elephant fighting and is the intermingling of their blood. Vegetable and animal sources include carmine here from little insects, saffron, a yellow colour, blue from indigo and woad, and pink from mud. She's got some jokes, everyone. Don't worry. <laughs> So, so <laughs> dragon, dragon's blood is a very hardcore ink. You are correct. It's a very hardcore pigment. Um, but like you said, pigments are made out of sort of whatever people had around or whatever they could afford to have uh, uh, sent to them. Um, now, it, in, in some other places, so these are examples from New Mexico and I believe it's Chile. No, in Mexico. Um, and these pigments would have most likely come from different clays or chalks that people had on hand um, based on what they had around them in the ground. Um, and they would sort of grind those up and put them on there. Um, yeah, so let me see. I think we can. Ruthann is going to show us something really quickly. It's really pretty, I promise. <laughs> okay. So this is the Sarmuse. It is a book of hours. It is also a book of hours. The reason why I want to show this to you is because I want you to think about how many people have to grind down pigments and inks, <laughs> to grind down pigments and inks in order to create such a vibrant image. So we've got these deep yellows. We've got these blues. We also know that during this period of time, lapis lazuli was like more expensive than gold. 
<laughs> like, it was very hard to find. It was very hard to prepare. And so it was, it's kind of a huge deal. And this is, this is not a facsimile. It's kind of a huge deal that this um, page has um, blue in it. Um, and there's these gorgeous reds. I picked this out specifically because the greens are stunning. Um, yeah. And there's a little bit of gold leaf in there too. But the thing that I find really interesting and it's important to note is that um, because things are made from animal, mineral, and uh, fruits and vegetables and things, um, things that were made with fruits and vegetables, ooh, they don't hang. They can't hang <laughs> for a very long time. Um, they fade pretty quickly um, unless they are, unless they're stored really well. So some of these um, are ink pigments made from, really some of these actually might be vegetable ones. They're just really, really faded. Um, and some, and a lot of them are mineral. Mineral lasts a really long time. But I just think that this book is absolutely gorgeous. And I am kind of obsessed with the, oh, there's like pinks in there. Oh, that blue, very pricey. Mm -hmm. The strawberries are as cute as can be. People got really, people did some really, really interesting things in sort of the, these are typically like breaks between chapters um, when you get these really elaborate illumination, these really elaborate um, uh, pieces. And it's, it's one of my favorite things. It's one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> However, it wasn't just inks, and I just want to touch on a little bit of history on some of the dyes that would have been used during this period of time. Um, so these, what you're looking at right now, are three different kinds of purple. It's, it's really important to remember that our conception of the color purple is very different than what other people than what folks back in the past would have been using. And on the frank, quite frankly, anyone before um, what anyone would have thought of before like 1850, uh, their purple would have been like more of a, um, oh, I'll talk about illuminations in a second. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, so the history of purple is kind of really fascinating because I think for a lot of people, it's seen as like a very royal color. Um, some emperors, Roman, Roman, <laughs> Roman, uh, went so far as to ban anyone else from wearing it, which is kind of funny because people couldn't afford purple. <laughs> so this is very excessive because no one can afford it. Um, now, purple is thought to have existed. So it was thought to have existed since the fourth century. However, earlier this year, archaeologists archaeologists in Israel actually discovered a piece of wool fabric that's dyed dating from 1000 BC, which is insane. Um, historically, this color, this dye would have been made from the uh, Bolinus brandaris or the Murex brandaris, which is a kind of snail uh, that lived in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, could only be acquired through fishing or if it just happened to wash across the shore. Now, I'm going to tell you a really, really sad thing. So <laughs> um, in order to get these purple, the purple actually comes from a mucus secretion from snails that they that they use to fight predators. Think like an octopus just sort of like, just like squirting at people, um, and as a protective lining for egg sacs. So there were kind of two ways to go about getting a lot of purple, which is that you could either milk milk the snails, which means you just sort of squeeze them and just scare them a bunch of times until you've got the amount of ink that you want. Um, but if you're, or you could boil them, which makes me very sad. Um, people often chose the boiling method because no one wants to sit and frighten snails for an extended period of time. Um, but for context and to understand exactly how expensive this dye would have been if it was on anything in these books, um, 12,000 snails? would need to be boiled in order to make 1.4 grams of dye. So that's like a quarter teaspoon. That is 12,000 little babies have to die for a quarter teaspoon, which is why, why would you ban this? No one can afford this. <laughs> no one has this dye. Um, however, the purple that we think about was actually created in 1856 by William Henry Perkin, who was a British chemist attempting to make, um, how do we say, it? Quin quinine? which at the time was a um, treatment from malaria. Um, now, and I think it's important and uh, to note in here, which is that many amateur chemists 
throughout the medieval period, throughout like the history of alchemy have been trying to create a lot of different pigments and colors um, and also lots of other things. And um, they didn't do a great job all the time. Um, they often injured themselves. They often poisoned themselves, especially when we get to, when you see those beautiful illustrations of white, that's lead, baby. That's all lead. Um, and it's not good for you. It is not good for you, in case you were wondering. Um, so a little bit about illumination. So a man so an illumination is a manuscript that is decorated usually with gold or silver. So the gold was very really common, commonly used, and because it was seen, the inclusion of gold was seen as honoring God. Um, so much so that in order to in order to get the, the gold to truly shine, it was actually slightly lifted above um, the, the rest of the image that it would have been used. Um, and it was often used to denote breaks in text or chapters or prayers and uh, things like that. There are three main types of illuminations. They are initials, which is what you what you think of when you see when you see like the big like O oh, for the once upon a time um, borders, which we've also seen some borders around different texts and miniature illustrations. And now we know that miniature does not mean small. <laughs> and many of these miniature illustrations would have um, been examples such as carpet pages, um, which Ruthann is going to show us a little bit of that. Actually, wait, no, I'm gonna. I'm going to show you a carpet page first. <laughs> oh, wait, no, oh, never seeing, mind. Sorry. No, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Wow, 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 wow. This, so it is also important to remember, this is a, um, this is a facsimile as well, because wow, baby, wow, baby. <laughs> this, how, it is a facsimile, however, it is in fact a real gold leaf um, that is, has been put into these pages and you just get such a shine. It feels very glorious. It's again, like I said, slightly lifted up. Wow. These blues again, if it was a real thing, I'd be like, yo, this blue is wild. I mean, it's also beautiful still, but, um, okay. Yes. It's okay. Byzantine. It is Byzantine. Yes. Is there any questions? Yes. Um, so I just, I think it's really great. And um, it's really important when we think about like these pages that would have been used, um, these sort of carpet pages and things, um, there is a bit of debate. There is a bit of debate about still what these actually would have been used uh, to do or what they meant. So this is an example of carpet pages that are from a Quran from uh, Egypt from the 1300s. Now, again, the current conversation is, is sort of about whether these are about dividing the chapters or because these are literally carpets that people used to pray on, if this was at, these were actually put in the middle of these prayers to denote, this is the time for you to take a, a break for prayer. Um, and, or just to sort of, remind you to get yourself in in the place of reflection so you can read and you can worship. Now I am going to sort of skip by uh, gold leaf. Gold leaf is essentially made by you melt down gold, <laughs> you melt it down into a little brick, and then you just hammer it out. Like you hammer it and you hammer it and then you cut it into pieces and then you give that to someone else who keeps hammering and you keep hammering it, keep hammering it, keep hammering it, keep hammering it. You keep hammering it until it is thinner than a piece of paper. Um, and then it can be applied. Um, it can be applied. Do you hammer? You, yes. Yes, you hammer it. <laughs> and what you do is you actually apply a little bit of um, sort of like a chalk mixture. Um, that would be sort of like a chalk and sort of a binder, and you place that on. It would actually go on before any of the illustrations. So you place that on the paper, um, and then you'd breathe on the chalk. <laughs> or is a little bong glue. Oh, uh, 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 not exactly, but not too much bong glue. Mostly just like water, <laughs> mostly water and like paste. Um, and you breathe on it to add a little moisture, and then you place the gold leaf on there. And then you, and once you've let it settle, once the moisture is dried, it will literally stick to that. And it's always raised a little bit up so that it can really capture um, the light and the shine. I can show you all that video later, but this is also about applying it with the 
plaster mixture. And um, now what we're going to do is that Carrie is going to give us a little bit of a demonstration so y'all can get to hustling. It'll be great. Thank you. Yes, give me just a second here, me Laura, to get Carrie's spotlit here. So give me just a second. All right, Carrie, you are spotlit, and then I think you need to stop. Sharing. Yep. I think I'm good. I think it's good. Perfect. Hi, All right, everybody. so we we can see you, Carrie. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. I can. All right. I'm gonna switch now that you've seen my face for a second. I'm gonna switch over to my um, camera that's set up here to demonstrate some calligraphy for you. Perfect, and before you start, Carrie, someone asked if this is being recorded, and it absolutely is, and you will all have access to this recording. So if you need to leave at any time early, don't fear, you'll be able to watch the rest of this. All right, great. Um, so before I get started here, you might notice that I have a slanted surface. Uh, this is, of course, the way we saw them doing it in some of the pictures that Ruthann showed. And uh, mine's just made from like a bookend. But um, if you can prop your prop a book up on some other books or something, if you're gonna practice this later, it will just help you not to make such a mess because sometimes the ink tends to run out of the pen if you're holding it really vertically instead of this uh, slanted surface really helps um, you to regulate the ink a little bit more. Also, I think as they mentioned before, you want to just have some um, extra paper below the paper you're going to work with to protect your table because it will bleed through the paper. Um, I'm, so I'm going to start with just some line paper. I think we gave you guys some graph paper in your kits. Um, you might find it easier to just make your first practice it, practicing without any graph paper or with simply lined paper, but it's all, it's going to take some practice, so <laughs> whatever you want to start with is fine. I also have some scratch paper here because um, you're going to find that when you start to use the quill, uh, an unexpected amount of ink sometimes comes out first. So you want to have a little practice paper here on the side before you go in on your like good paper. So the basic premise of using a quill pen, I'm gonna have to keep, keep doing this to get my camera to cooperate, um, is this quill that is cut to a bevel. So if I contact the paper this way, it's gonna make a really thin line. And if I contact the paper this way, it's gonna swell into a thicker line. And that's really kind of what um, the idea of, of Western calligraphy is built on, these sort of thicks and thins. If you think about how an M in a book looks, there's like the thick lines um, and the thin lines of it to mimic um, how it would work with a quill pen. So you guys all were given, if you got the kits, you have a quill and a little pot of ink. So you can get those out. And I'm going to simply dip just the very tip of mine in there. And um, I'm going to start by just practicing thick line. Oh, I got to move down a little bit. Bear with me. I'm trying to match up my hand with what the camera sees. So thick, thick lines. And then if I keep my tip of the quill just as I have it, but move it a different way, I can get thin lines. So thick, thin, thick, thin. Um, I also wanted to just say before we get started too, too far, uh, not everybody might have had a chance to get the kit. So I also wanted to just share that these, um, there exists other alternatives if you don't have a quill and you do want to go back and practice this tomorrow or something before you can get your hands on a quill. Um, a lot of art stores will have these um, calligraphic pens and it's the same idea where you've got a thick edge. Gosh. You've got your thick edge and your thin edge. And so at the same, in the same way you can make thick lines 
uh, thick lines and thin lines. And if you also don't want to run out to the art store and get a calligraphy marker, um, you can take a simple pencil and you can actually um, use sandpaper or just scribble, scribbling it on a piece of paper and using a little blade to help you make a chisel edge um, using a pencil. And you can practice in the same way. So I'll show you over here uh, the same thick line, thin line. So with that, I'll get started. Um, I see a question in the chat that I'm also going to address. Um, actually, let me just let me let me mix up my order and address that question right now. Um, so somebody um, looks like Jan got one of our quills in the the kit that might have been damaged. So all these quills were just, you know, rattling around in bags. So it's possible that you got one that has a tip that isn't really beveled very well or that like the the two little prongs of your quill are wanting to stay apart like this. They're not wanting to go back together. And you can fix that yourself. Um, also, a lot of the quills I noticed as we were packing the kits came to a really, really sharp point. And I find it a lot easier to work with if they have a slight bevel. Um, so I'm going to just take a pair of scissors and I'm going to turn the quill so that I'm seeing the inside. Um, there we go. And I'm right, I'm right handed, so I want to man my scissors with my right hand. Uh, I'm going to hold my quill with my left hand and I'm just going to simply come up here at a very slight angle and snip. I totally forgot before I did that to demonstrate what what was happening with the bad the bad quilt. And but I did here I did this earlier, and uh, this is what will happen when you go if your if your quill is split like that, you'll be able to dip and you'll you'll be able to make your thin line just fine. But when you go to make your thick line, those two little tines will come apart and make you just won't get enough contact. And I'm guessing that might be what happened to Jan. Um, so hopefully uh, by doing that, you will be able to kind of correct your quill. So I cut that off and actually that's kind of a thicker bevel than what I want. So I'm gonna actually whittle this down a little bit even to make uh, a thinner tip. So don't be afraid of this, you can, um, I mean, do be a little bit afraid. You don't want to cut it all the way to where you don't have <laughs> any quill left. But you can gently take a, a very sharp scissor and make some little cuts. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep this so you can see. Focus. So I'm just making um, some little, little cuts just to um, come to a little bit of a thinner, a, uh, a thinner point. <laughs> so hopefully that helped some people who are struggling already before we get started. Um, so this is kind of a, a very thick nib I've made on this one. Oh, it's still doing that a little bit. So actually I'm gonna go in and snip it one more time. Come into focus. So it is really important that you hold it very, very still and make a very clean cut. Yeah, Oop. move down so you can see. Um, if, you're, if you're still getting that double, that strange double line, it might actually just be that you need to dip it a little more often in the ink because that will also just happen as you're as your pen runs out of ink. Or it sometimes is a matter of simply changing the angle um, that you're contacting the paper with. So, sorry, I dwelled on that for a long time, <laughs> but I'm gonna um, jump in. Hopefully um, people's quills will be working and start demonstrating how to write this script. So we also set you guys up with a couple of um, papers in your kit that are going to talk about each 
letter individually. Um, and this is the Uncial script, which was used from the third to the sixth century. So really kind of very early in the medieval period, almost even, even <laughs> underlapping that initial date. Um, and there's also some um, exercises you can come back and do later. I do recommend reading these, uh, reading all the little tips and tricks that they're going to give you in these sheets. But I'm going to just go through. I'm not going to present this A, A through Z. I'm going to present it in an order that kind of makes more sense to me, that sort of simplifies it. So the very most, uh, most simple letter of all of them is the I. So I'm going to start by just holding my pen sort of at a 45 degree angle. I'm going to contact the paper, bring it down, and give it a little bit of a tail. So it's pretty, pretty much straight up and down. And I'm going to um, be dipping my pen in the ink at least once for every letter. Um, Oh, I see it. someone put a helpful tip in the chat that maybe if anyone's still having trouble could help them. The next um, letter is almost the same as an I, but it's I'm going to add this little spot at the top and it's going to be a T. So you can see that split is still happening to me and it's just that I need to go back and re-up my ink supply. So horizontal line, add an I, becomes a T. So the third letter, I'm still going to start with the very same I shape, and I'm going to flip it up a little bit more at the end. I'm going to come back and add some loops, and it becomes my B. And as you're experimenting, it there's a sort of a, a, a lot of different things going on. It is a matter of pressure sometimes. So as you're coming around to make the B, I'm sort of pushing harder where I'm doing the straight line, and then I'm easing up on the pressure to help that taper happen. So I'm using very light pressure, heavier pressure, light, light again, heavy again, light again. And it's just going to take practice to sort of get all those nuances to work together. I still need a lot of practice as well. I'm <laughs> I've been practicing for this uh, webinar, but I'm still not an expert. So the next couple letters are going to be the same basic I form, but I'm going to expand them upward to be an ascender above the line. So instead of starting here, I'm going to start a little bit above the line. I'm going to give it the same little serif. And then I'm going to add this little swoop to become my H. Let's see. Oh, do you guys want to man the chat? <laughs> yeah, giving, giving the ink a little bit of a shake will probably help. OK, so I'm going to start with the same basic I form with it oh, with a tail. And then this one's got one mark that way. And a little swoop in, that's my K. It's really a, a learning curve to, to figure out how deep to, you know, dip your pen and it's kind of a, a, a balance between too much and too little all the time. Okay, um, so next letter I'm going to start with the same basic form, but at the end I'm going to do a little swoop up similar to if I was going to do the B, but that's it. It's going to be an L. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, the next couple letters, I'm going to um, start with that same basic I form, uh, but I'm going to put it at a slant. So I'm going to start on my on my upper line. I'm going to do a diagonal diagonal I shape. Still with a little serif. I'm going to add a little swoop here, and it's our A. Diagonal I. Okay. Try to turn this a little. The next letter, let's see if I can not mess it up. It's one of the most beautiful ones in this font. Um, I'm going to start with the same diagonal line. And I'm going to start a little bit below my lower line, so it's a little bit of a descender. I'm going to do a little swoop, and it's an X. This is a, a good one, a really fun one to experiment with to make sure you're doing those like thicks and thins. It should be very thin going up. Um, all of the letters and the the handout that is in your kit will help you sort of so, sort of guide you through these. But um, the idea is always that you're moving from top to bottom and left to right. So actually, this this part of the X feels a little weird because you're going up with it, and that's a little bit unusual. Um, if you get a lot of practice with this, you'll find it's much easier to sort of go in this left to right, top to bottom uh, motion with, with all of your letters. OK, the next couple of letters we'll do, um, I'm going to start again with the same basic form of I. But instead of stopping now and swooping to the right, I'm going to go, I'm going to make a descender and swoop to the left. And that's going to be a J. which I don't think actually existed in this, uh, in medieval times. There, there, I, think there's, I think there's a blurb about that on the, the handout, but, <laughs> but everything else is built on the J, so we're gonna include it here because the next letter, it's gonna start with the J, even if it doesn't exist. <laughs> and then it's gonna get one line up here and another identical line down here, and B and F. Next letter is going to start again with the same basic J. And then it's going to get a little rounded. Do that and be a P. <laughs> I'm going to do that one again. can always go back and add add more tail if it needs it. <laughs> All right, same basic formula. This time I'm going to make this the same shape but a little bit shallower so that I can have room to make my little tail for my R. Okay, this one is, oh, I'm already getting ink on my fingers. Maybe maybe some of you are doing the same. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with the same J. Okay, and then I've got a swoop here and a swoop here. That's going to be an N. Okay. Now we will move on to the Y, which is going to actually be a combination of the A and the J. So I'm going to make the same sort of diagonal that would be an A, but instead of flipping it up, I'm going to flip it down. So we've got kind of a sideways J, diagonal J. 
Then I'm going to add the same sort of little flourish that was at the end of my X here. And a little dot. <laughs> That was a good quill noise. I don't know if the microphone can can pick up these little scritchy sounds. I think Zoom's kind of Zoom filters those noises out a little, which is tragic for something like this. Okay, now we're going to move on to the curvy letters. So the curviest of letters, well, maybe not the curviest. The most circular of letters is the O. So you see that I'm um, doing it in two separate parts because it will be <laughs> sort of violent on my quill if I try to do it all at once. See, my quill starts to work against me and it sputters out ink if I try to do it all in one motion. So I'm going to do it in two motions. <laughs> Siobhan. It's making sound effects for us. Okay. Okay, very similar to the O is the C. So I'm going to do a half an O, but instead of connecting the whole thing, I'm just going to add the top of my C. And for the same reason, I want to avoid this sort of like ink spurting by doing it in two movements instead of one. Um, the next one is my favorite of letters <laughs> of this script. It's so pretty. So I've still got my half an O. I'm going to add a little tail to it. And the top of the C, and that's a G. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. We're almost done. Um, the E is very similar. It's going to start with half an O, make it into a C, and then I'm just going to add a little tail. The D, same thing, I'm going to make a half of an O. And then I'm going to bring this, it's going to have a little bit of an ascender. So above the line, bring that curve around and connect it. So the next letter is an M. This one threw me for a loop when I was learning this because you might think it would start with an I form, but it doesn't. It starts with half an O. So I'm going to go in like I'm making an O, and then I'm going to connect it to sort of an I form. And then bring a curvy, it's almost, almost the other half of the O comes at the end. I'm going to do that one one more time. Okay, just a few more left. I'm gonna start with another half of an O, but instead of making it this curvy, I'm gonna bring it straight over and make a, a right angle here and flick to the left. And that's actually a Q. It looks a little bit like a G, but this is our G, it's beautiful. This is a Q. <laughs> okay, these uh, next. this next letter is also one that's a little bit, um, Strain. It's like a little bit counterintuitive. You start with a little serif as though you're going to make an I, but then you bring it into a half an O again. Very strange. And then you're going to add an I form to it, and that's going to be a U. The V is going to start with an I form at a slant, so I'm going to make my little I kind of sideways. And then I'm going to come in with another curvy, like almost like I'm completing a, an O and connect it. These two letters will get combined to make a W. So I'm going to start with that weird little serif and bring it into my half an O. I'm going to add sort of an I shape with a, with a little tail at the end. And then come back around with one more. One more stroke to connect there to make the W. So U plus V is W. And then there's 
two more letters. The first one starts with a weird horizontal line. So this is the first time we've actually come in with a, a horizontal line like that from um, left to right. I'm going to add a top, a top tail and a bottom tail to it. Make an S. I'll try that one again. That was a little awkward. Yes. And then we've got the Z, which is a swoop, a swoop, and a swoop, just like Zorro. <laughs> that one's the fastest letter to make, I think. Well, maybe the I, maybe the I. But that is the whole alphabet. Um, and I think, I know we're running short of time, so I think that with that, we'll open up to some questions. And I'm just going to maybe sit here and quietly write. <laughs> while Ruthann and Siobhan answer questions. Carrie, thank you so much. Thank You're you so welcome. much, Carrie. Absolutely, like just so fascinating watching you, watching you write. It's such a treat. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I like got very relaxed just watching you write those letters. I'm like, oh, yes. Um, so yeah, we are going to open up the Q&A. So if anyone has, we, we don't have that much time left. Um, so if anyone wants to throw something in the Q&A, or if you'd like to just ask it in the chat, that's totally fine too. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get to a few questions. How long does it typically take the ink to dry? I would, uh, I'd let it sit and not touch it for a little while. <laughs> give it, give it at least a good 10 minutes um, before you try to jostle it at all. You can kind of tell if you look at your paper and like look at an angle, like I can tell where mine is still wet. It'll kind of have a sheen to it. You'll know for sure. You'll know. Um, <laughs> Uh, what were common tools used to cut the shape of the quills? So people would use a pretty standard knife, just like a little pen knife, whatever they have on hand. Um, we've used, um, in the past, we've had workshops where we actually have people make quills. Um, that is why we did not make yours. <laughs> it is a very messy process. Um, it is a very, very messy process um, with a lot of sharp pieces. And I'm not just talking about the, the razors that we have to use. I mean, it, it took us, what, three passes through the vacuum to get all of the, to get all of the, <laughs> the feathers, uh, not the feathers, but to get all the tips out. It was bad. Do we ever use sand to dry it? Which it? We're talking about quills, yeah. Quills, yes. Oh, the ink. Oh, the ink. Mm. So. No. Usually air dry is is plenty effective. Um, it's not oil-based, so it'll it'll dry relatively quickly. But again, I would strongly encourage y'all to <laughs> give it some time. What kind of ink do we have in the kit? We gave you all India ink, which I did not talk about. <laughs> but it, it is it is actually one of the most common inks that people use if you if you're going to like a calligraphy store. It, you can you can make it. You can make. There's people who make it all the time. Yeah, you can get it at Art Coop. Yeah, or online, but Art Coop carries it. How do we care for the quill? That is a fantastic question. Um, you don't need to wash it off. Quite frankly, the typical care for the quill is to cut the tip off. <laughs> like as you're, primarily because as you're using it, the tip will lose its sharpness and not be able to hold the ink in the same way that you, hmm? and Ruthann's gonna tell a story. <laughs> So um, and when we're talking about 12th century when scribes became something that was done as a professional trade, um, you prepped the day before. 
so that when you went to go do your your next day's work, you were you know ready to go. And since you were being paid by how quickly you could do it, you wanted to be able to do this as fast as possible. So scribes, instead of just taking their one quill and going the whole day using one quill, they'd make giant piles. <laughs> maybe not giant, but they'd make piles of quills that they pre-cut the night before and they'd go through, oh, this quill's done. <laughs> Grab another one. Okay, we're done. And then like they'd keep the pile of the quills that they're done. And then at night when it's maybe not the best time to be writing or doing those things, they'd cut the quills for the next day. So um, like when you're using a number two pencil, there just comes a point when it's not great to write with anymore <laughs> and so they'd set them aside and they would move on to the next one and um if i'm remembering correctly the average number of quills that a professional scribe would go th go through uh oh <laughs> we're, we're in the hundreds yeah. per day if you were good like if you were master level at your trade and you had a full slate of work you could go through several hundred quills a day and you'd prep them again for the for the next night so yeah that was my story <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Why does the Y have a dot over it, Carrie? Maybe you know. Sorry. Um, if you can't tell, the three of us are sitting in a row. So <laughs> we're making, we make faces, like, they're this way. <laughs> and we make faces like, we don't know why the Y has a dot over it is essentially what's happening here. Um, I would assume it was just to make sure it's distinguished from other letters that might look similar, like it, so it wouldn't be confused with like a V yeah. or something like that. Um, yeah, that's my assumption. But again, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Interesting. But it's a great question, and yeah. now I have to go find out. <laughs> Y'all can feel free to keep asking some questions. We've still got some time. I can't wait to see what the quick brown fox is going to jump over. So do we ever do classes for kids is a great question because this class was originally designed for high school age students. Um, Siobhan and I, oh gosh, when did we start this? Um, right before lockdown in March 2020. It was like February. It was Weeks. real bad. <laughs> Weeks before we were sent home. <laughs> um, so University High, the, the uni high on campus here does this thing called Agora Days where the students get to, um, they kind of pick from a smorgasbord of classes that are not like, you know, like math and science. There's a lot of like cooking classes or um, uh, there was a lot of dance, but uh, they ask for, if there's a call that goes out for classes from instructors that are around in the community or on the campus. And Siobhan and I pitched the Making Medieval Manuscripts class and that's how it was born. We taught um, we've taught twice now, one in person and one virtually with Uni High um, on how to do the, um, the it, essentially it's the same as this, except it was spread out over four days. So it was, it was different, but it's essentially the same thing. So yes, we do teach it to children. And that one also includes, the in-person one includes like ink making. And um, previously we've worked with the, um, one of the Red Book Conservators here. Um, and she does a really, really good demonstration of actually sewing the binding for a book, um, which is pretty great. That's awesome. We've had a few requests to do a class on book binding. So I'm going to be reaching out to you all again. We know oh, we know. <laughs> we know <a> <laughs> I, I personally love the binding part. So. <laughs> and it's kind of, I think it, I like it because it's similar to the ink making where like, they're just, they're doing whatever they want. <laughs> I think we, we have this idea that they were very particular, and some, some people are, some people, but um, most people were learning how to make this from just, like, whoever was around. <laughs> um, so they just, whatever, whatever held the book together was the binding. Whatever series of knots and holes held the book together, that's what you got. 
Uh, Quinn does a much neater version of this, though. I promise. I love it. I love it. Um, we just have a couple more questions pop in here. So one of the ones I see is what would have been considered a good day's work for someone and was work measured, measured by page. Um, if we're talking about scribal culture, like, uh, sorry, scribal, uh, scribal, um, like this is what you're doing for a living. Um, it's measured by project. Is that my, so like you would be contracted to do this certain amount of things. Um, this fancy warrant or legal document or this book of hours or whatever it is. So it kind of depends on what your patron is paying for. And um, it, so measured by page, it, it's a bit subjective. Um, and what would have been considered a good day's work? Uh, I guess you have to be comfortable with that. Um, if you are a master scribe, you can power through a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you can make a full size, like a, a standard size book of hours a um, couple of weeks what would take a monk in a monastery a couple of years so um, if you're good at what you're doing you can create a whole manuscript um, in just a few weeks if you are still learning the trade obviously you're going to take a little bit longer but I think that would be to be expected um, wow okay so Sorry, I, also, I, was reading the next I don't think there. we, and I don't think we mentioned this, a lot of the, the people oftentimes weren't just writing their own things. They were often copying books from other libraries, other monasteries, none are like other places. So sometimes a good day's work meant you got this much closer to being able to return someone's things to them. <laughs> um, and that's when, and that's why, um, that's oftentimes why speed was so good. I saw another question that says, how long will calligraphers train for? Um, that's a great question. Uh, scribes, I wanna say a year, but I can't think of the citation to back that up. Um, it was kind of however long it took you. Cause I think yeah. it's also important to remember some people did not train for very long, which is why if you were going to commission someone to make a book for you, they needed to show you samples. Cause some people would be like, I know calligraphy, I got you, let's do it. Oh, I can do miniatures in this book. And they could not, <laughs> they could not do it. Um, so it really, it takes, it takes anywhere from like a couple months to like years. People have varying, in order to become like a master scribe. Yeah, it's gonna take a long time and a lot yeah. of apprenticeship. So. Or the, um for the monks that are doing this for worship, they would only be doing this maybe a few hours a day if they were lucky. Um, but like Siobhan mentioned, they're not, they don't own these books. The way that um, we think of libraries now is not how libraries functioned in the medieval period. Um, you kind of, you could borrow books from other monasteries and like you'd be call up your neighbor and be like, hey, can we borrow this? And then you make a copy of it and then you return it. Um, but sometimes because books are so valuable, you, you can't, they won't let you borrow it. So you have to go to them and then you make a copy while you're there. And then you bring that copy back and either that's the copy you make, or you make a better copy out of the copy that you originally made. Um, and that's pretty much libraries for like all of that, like that's how libraries function because books were a valuable commodity. So you would travel to the place to access the book, but you couldn't take it out. You had to like the Library of Alexandria, right? This really famous, like really big library. It was a place where you could go, but scholars lived there. It wasn't just, let's go look at the book. You lived there because you had to spend that much time with the item. So yay for libraries and checking out books now. And oftentimes they literally chain them to the table yes. <laughs> or to the shelves. So like, it's not even, you can't even go to another room to go look at this book by yourself. You got, you got a smooth for maybe three to five feet um, that you can get away from where this book was on the shelf. Um, so they really did need to live there. <laughs> by how the times have changed. <laughs> uh, it? Oh, yeah. I actually, someone mentioned a metal nib. I actually have a metal. I'm going to do my influencer YouTube hand. 
Um, I also I actually have a metal nib here that I did not show uh, let you. Me, let me spotlight you for a second. Oh, okay. to, I'm just going to add you here so they can see. So you can see the metal nib um, that works very, this paper. it works very similarly to how, oh no, that's not hard enough, but, but it also sort it of was, spreads, yeah, a, we could see it. spreads apart a little bit the same way that, ooh, got my finger for a second, <laughs> uh, the same way that your quills do. Um, they're pretty great. They're, I mean, they're really good if you're trying to learn how to do this. Um, and you don't necessarily want uh, a big supply of uh, feathers in your in your home. Someone also also asks, are there certain bird feathers especially suited for quills? Yes. Um, I think we talked about uh, geese, these are turkey, swan, and but but really the big thing is that and eagle, although I would not encourage doing that. <laughs> Hard would not encourage that, um, and that's because you need you need a bird that has a really big wingspan um, to get to get like enough to actually like be able to write. Um, and you can kind of pick some of these off towards the bottom, but you only got so much. You only you only get so much space that you can actually like write with. So you want to use something with really really big wings. Uh, the other thing is I don't. know. I don't know if you mentioned this, tell me if you did, but um, there's only a specific set type of feather you can use. It has to be the primary flight feather. Yes. You can't just go pluck a turkey and use the feather off their back. <laughs> it has to be that primary flight because it has, uh, what is, is it, is it the quick, the, the, like the, the circumference of the, that, like the part where the thing it has, to, yeah, that it has to be big enough to be able to take the ink and the cutting and the flight feathers are the only ones that do that. Yeah. It's also why you use big birds. They're, we're not taking feathers off the sparrows. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you see in movies, the big peacock one where it's like this big fluffy, no, no, that was no. Um, Carrie carries the quill that Carrie's writing with. And if you can see the way it's trimmed, that's historically accurate. Um, so they trim the feather so that when they're laying over your hand, this also addresses the question for knowing which way. If you hold the quill, it curves over your hand, and that's how you know which direction, like if it's a left or a right-handed one. And so they would trim the feathers like Carrie has on hers, because then the feathers don't get away, get in the way of your hand. Yeah, it may look pretty if you've got the, the fluffy plume on the end of it, but it's not, it's not practical for, for actually getting this stuff done. So, it kind yeah. of hits you in the face a little bit as you're writing. <laughs> but it's gorgeous in films. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. Okay. I oh, can think... we answer the punctuation one? Yes, right? please. I was going to say, let's end with the punctuation, punctuation question. What punctuation? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, let, me, let me see. Uh, okay, cool. Let's see this star I'm going to say because it's right now, it's tiny. So one of the big problems when we're talking about translating, uh, especially Latin, is that they don't use punctuation. So it becomes a bit of a problem to be able to tell what you're reading. You kind of got to guess. So I'm just going to use the, the camera on here. But can you, you can see the lines, right? There's no periods. There's no commas. Uh, when we're talking about verse and like religious texts, you can tell where the lines start because they use the red ink. So, I mean, you can tell the different like sections that way, but there's no period. You just kind of got to figure it out as you go along. Yeah. Just guessing. Yep. I would also say that in medieval Qurans, th so the colors also mean like um, who's speaking, like if it's Muhammad and also gives you different, the colors can indicate um, different parts of the prayer or like if there's supposed to be song and things like that. The, so the colors are actually very important for understanding what the breaks are. And this is why they put miniatures <laughs> in between things and drawings in between things. So you, even if you didn't know where the sentence ended, um, you would be able to know when that group of sentences <laughs> ended. That makes sense. All right, everybody, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, I super appreciate uh, 
everyone joining us this evening. Thank you, Ruthann, Carrie, and Siobhan, and Rachel. Uh, thank you so much for presenting this webinar. This was amazing. Um, I'm going to add myself in here so y'all can see all of our faces here. Rachel, we'll add Rachel in here as well. Here was the group behind everything you just saw this evening. So thank you all for coming. And if you have um, questions, you can always reach out to, you can reach out to the Champaign Public Library. You can reach out to the Rare Book and Manuscript Library and, or you could reach out to the Ricker Library of Architecture and Art. So we've got you covered here if you've got questions. Um, and I do want to let you know the next Crafty Adults that we'll be doing is Cookies and Canvases. So that is our version of like a paint and sip party, except for we're eating cookies because um, we're a library, you know. So we're going to do that. That'll be in December. So we will not be having an event in November, but we'll be doing our Cookies and Canvases December 8th. It'll also be at 630 and the registration will open up on December 1st. So keep that in your uh, calendars if you're interested. Cookies and Canvases, I will tell all of you here first, it is a popular one and it like sells out quickly. So if you want to get a spot, December 1st at 9 a.m. is your is the time to be looking for. So anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, I so appreciate it. Thank you again, Ruth Ann, Carrie, Siobhan, and Rachel. And we will see you all at the next Crafty Adults. This was recorded and you will be getting an email when the recording is up on YouTube so that you can peruse it again or watch Carrie's wonderful calligraphy. So anyway, thanks, y'all. We're going to end now. Bye. Thanks, y'all.